Hey there, everyone. This is Karen Richman. I was Gidget in the 80s, and I played Greg Brady's wife on The Brady's. And you are listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Hey, Tommy, you got a good joke for me? <laughs> hey, dudes. Welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s-themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Barbara Mallory Schwartz, the wife of legendary TV producer Lloyd Schwartz, who was the son of legendary TV producer Sherwood Schwartz. She played, of course, Mrs. Powell on the, the Brady Bunch reunions. She's also had a great career in other films and television. She was a Manson girl in Helter Skelter. She was um, in um, Airplane. She played a religious zealot who um, approaches the uh, Harry Krishnas in the movie. Um, she was in this horror movie called uh, Blood of the Iron Maiden with John Carradine. She's had a great career, and I'm going to talk to her about all that stuff today. And I think it's going to be pretty good. The, the world is crazy, but it just keeps getting better. So yeah, here is my interview with Barbara Mallory Schwartz. Hello. Hello, Barbara. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm really good. Really good, thanks. Oh, this is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, well, thank you for asking me. <laughs> of course. So, uh, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Um, yeah, I guess I did. I was one of those uh, kids who just, you know, like sang uh, Broadway tunes in her ba basement and acted out things and... Um, just had a good time. Um, I didn't know then I wanted to be an actress, just had a good time. Mm -hmm. Did you do a lot of school plays and community theater? You know, I, I was uh, in high school. I didn't do it, uh, and an English teacher came up to me and he said, we're doing a play, a Moliere play, and uh, would you be in it? And I had no clue. I mean, I wanted to be an actress or anything. And um, it was for a contest, and so I said, sure. And somehow I knew how to do a, an English accent and did, it, and, and did it and won the contest. And I went, oh, my goodness. And so, um, and I was one that became, I was one of those, I wasn't really popular in high school, but yeah. once uh, um, I discovered my, uh, my theater friends, and, uh, and so it changed, it actually changed everything for me. Yeah, I was such an outcast in school. I wanted to be part of the theater and all that stuff, but the theater kids didn't accept me for some reason. Oh, yeah. They, actually, they saved my life. <laughs> really? <laughs> I wasn't a cheerleader. I wasn't, you know. And, um, so it was, um, yeah, it was great to, to find the theater, the theater friends. Yeah. Where, where are you originally from? I'm from Minneapolis. Oh, so and then, actually, when I was 17, there's a company called the Minneapolis Children's Theater Company, which is very famous now, but it was just starting. And so I auditioned and got in there, and um, now they're international. They're very, very famous. But I was, like, one of the original members. Yeah, I know a lot of, of actors from Minnesota, and they told me when they were growing up, you know, in the 50s, 60s, whatever, it, it wasn't, it didn't have... Um, what it has now in terms of theater. It's, it's a lot more of a theater town now than it was then. Oh, yeah, it's a very big, you know, because then the Guthrie Theater came. Mm -hmm. they, they came, like, like as I was leaving to come out here, because I, I came out to Los Angeles to go to the Pasadena Playhouse. They had a very good drama de um, department. And um, I auditioned and got accepted and moved out and then they closed <laughs> they closed the whole thing <laughs> so i was out here so you went straight and, uh, you went straight to los angeles you didn't want to go to new york uh, at the time you know i was i was barely 18 from minneapolis and my parents said no we can go to los angeles but new york was 
you know, like, you know, no. But um, but then the Playhouse had, it was very, very um, well known and that I got accepted and I was very excited. And as soon as I moved out, they closed the whole department. So um, I moved into a thing called the Hollywood Studio Club, mm-hmm. which was um, a hotel for women going into theater and movies and everything. And I, I lived there for a couple of years and just took acting classes and started acting. But it was, it was a very interesting place. Yeah, did you uh, have any classmates that went on to become successful? Um, actually, when I lived there, Sally Struthers lived there. Oh, nice. Just uh, before uh, yeah, all of the so family. She, 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 she's uh, the, the most famous person of um, my time. Yeah, from from when you were there, yeah. How, yeah. How about any teachers that were um, uh, famous? Um... Well, they weren't famous. We would know um, they, uh, they, they were. There they, weren't names that you would know, like Estelle Harmon. And I just kind of took from individual teachers. Uh, uh, I would just take different classes, uh, acting classes around, and then I kind of called an. Uh, I called someone who I thought was an acting teacher, who turned out to be a manager, and he huh. said to me, "Well, let me meet you." And then he became my manager and agent. And then that time, I mean, I was 18 years old and, you know, and it was very easy to get agents and go out for work and, um, you know, when you were young. And so I went out for, for a lot of, a lot of things, you know, Mm -hmm. they were casting all these young parts. Yeah. You made your uh, debut in a low budget horror movie called Blood of the Iron Maiden. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I actually wore a bikini in that one. I see that go, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, and then there was, like, Room 222, was a, you know, those. And uh, I did some commercials, young, you know, where, you know, I was eating candy and a lot of those commercials. And, um, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, I forget all those ones that I did. Um, well, I got a whole list here. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad, because I forget. I forget. Yeah, so so uh, when you got cast in that, were you a horror fan? No, no, not at all. I just uh, um, just went out for it, and and uh, at that time, I mean, I had hair down to my my shoulder, you know, shoulders and everything, and uh, was the right type and kind of hippie. Was hippie, yeah, uh, and got cast. You know? Yeah, John Carradine was in it. Uh, John Carradine, yeah, John Carradine was in that. Yeah, we, very sweet, very nice. Yeah, I interviewed his uh, granddaughter a few years ago, and she told me she has nothing but fond memories of him. Yeah, he was very sweet. He he, he was very sweet to me because I was so young and hadn't done anything really, and uh, he he uh, was very very sweet and patient. We had a good time because it was very psychedelic, very, you know, 60s, you know, it was yeah. fun. I play, yeah, I, I'm usually, I play nuns or I get people, I did a lot of um, faith for today's where I would take drugs and get saved and drown and <laughs> possessed by devils. I, I, I had a lot of uh, parts where I got possessed by devils. <laughs> yeah, and also too, Dan Duryea's uh, son Peter was in it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. What, yeah. Um, what was he like? You know, I only have really good memories of of people that I worked with. I've been very fortunate that um, everybody's been really kind to me. <laughs> I don't know whether <laughs> it's like, please feel sorry for that. But no, everybody has always. Um, been very nice to me, very kind to me. So I don't have uh, 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 horror stories at all. You know, I think yeah. once on a commercial, I, I, I had a mean director, and then I found out that he was just mean to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good, <laughs> <laughs> good. But other than that, I've just been very fortunate. That's that's generally the case. You know, if, if someone's mean to you, they're mean to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I keep always oh he yelled at me. He said, oh no, that's just what he does. He just yells at everybody. <laughs> I said, oh good. 
<laughs> so when you guest starred on Room Two Twenty Two, I mean, did, did you did you know then that you know you were you were on such a a, a groundbreaking show? So I think, you know, after it was over, they went, oh, yeah, they discovered it was very groundbreaking. But at the time, I, I just didn't think of it. I was I was also fortunate because I think how I even got that show, I was in an acting class. And um, one, one of this actor and we, we had a comedy routine that we came up with. We had one routine, only one. And we took it to an acting um, contest somewhere, uh, and we did our routine, and a casting director came backstage, and his name was Eddie Foy. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I remember Eddie Foy? And he said, I love you. And he said, I want to get you a contract over at Screen Gems. And, um, I mean, it was such a fluke because this was not even in the city, but outside the city. And so he took me under his wing and everything he cast, he tried to put me in. Uh, so, and that's how I got room 222. He, he suggested me for a part and um, even Girls of the Huntington House, which I did after that, he made sure that I, w I was seen by all the producers. So he, he was my, my guardian angel. And just, just from something, a little contest that I did, uh, in the city with this one routine that we did. We didn't have another one, but we had our one routine that we took around. Mm -hmm. the, the, the girls of Huntington House, that was one of uh, Sissy Spacex's earliest roles. It was her first. Uh, it was with Shirley Jones, was the lead. And, and this was, this, uh, yeah, it was her first um, real acting job. And... Um, she, the rest is history, you know. She just, she was very, very special. If she hadn't done Prime Cut yet with Gene Hackman and Lee Marvin, then... No, no, I don't know. That all came, I think, later. I think The Girls of Huntington House was, like, her first. There was a group of us who, who kind of went out for things together. And um, there was one actress... Um, her name was Jamie Lee Smith, but mm -hmm. and I remember, uh, and it was that project, she had a ticket to go home, and she says, if I don't get this part, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to go back to school, or I'll stay here and work in L.A., and she got the part, uh, and, and so she stayed, but I remember she had actually a ticket in her hand, and she, if she didn't get this particular movie that I went um she was going to just move back home. So, oh. And it's interesting to see how many, you know, people still do things or they just, you know, retired. Or, but Sissy, yeah, she, it was her first job. Wow. And William Wimden, he played your father, right? Oh, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, he was a good actor. Yeah, I just remember Shirley Jones, and I remember she said to me, um, we were doing this scene, and she said, uh, oh, oh, something about being nervous, she was very sweet, don't be nervous, you know, and it was, it was a pretty big part for, you know, for me at that time, at that time, any time, and um, it's your first day, and don't be nervous, and I said, well, my first days are usually my last days, because usually an actress go <laughs> get a job and you're a day player <laughs> you get a big part play a day and then you're off you know so, yeah. but she was she was really supportive of, of me and uh, very very sweet that's good that's that's good to have peers that uh that uh support you and stuff you know especially the ones who can help you get work eventually yeah yeah well having having eddie and i stayed you know un until he died of a couple of years ago, but uh, we stayed close. Um, and in fact, I taught at a thing called the Donna Reed Festival in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw him. He said, "Oh, he says, you know, I used to cast the Donna Reed show." So he went. He would. He went to Iowa with us, and it was a whole um, thing in in Denison, Iowa, which was Donna Reed's hometown. Oh. And they did a festival and classes, and I taught there for 
uh, in the summer, we did a workshop for two weeks for 10 years. And, and then Eddie came and uh, he moved there for actually for a couple of years. Um, but it was great. So they set up scholarships for actors. Oh. Dennis and Iowa. Yeah. And some have moved, some have moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. And Barbara Remsen, who was also a casting director, went to teach. And she mentored kids from Iowa who actually lived with her and wanted to become actors. And she said, oh, come to my house. You'll live with me in L.A. And she did that with a couple actors from there. Wow. It is, yeah. just, people like that are so rare. They really are. They're rare, but but they're there, you know. I mean, you hear horror stories in Hollywood, but but there's some really, there were really good people, very supportive. People who, like, weren't even Hollywood per se, even though they lived there, they didn't have that mindset that Hollywood had. Yeah, the people who really, really wanted to help uh, actors or, or people, and very supportive, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the other thing I would say to the students, because everybody was so kind when we went back to teach, and I would say, well, everybody's kind and supportive, but yeah, that also can be a trap, because you can come here. Because I, I know a lot of actors who just um, fell by the wayside and just, you know, got very discouraged. And um, it, it's not, it's not e really easy to, to break into acting keep acting going you know yeah I, I tell people i say if you want to uh go to la um to further your acting career do it don't talk about it because others will discourage you and if they're really your friends they'll still talk to you after you leave if if not then it just wasn't <laughs> meant to be <laughs> you know it's so true it's so true yeah i know people are like oh my god I'm, you know what are, what are people going to think if i don't make it big you know and the truth is you know, like, you know, I, I'll i say about myself, you know, like, uh, I'm not a star or, you know, I'm on the series playing right now, but I came out here to act and, you know, I've commercials, I've done TV, movie, you know, and it, it's like, yeah, that's good. That's good. I've taught. I have, I've started a theater company, you know, I produce plays for kids, have a storybook theater, and I've done that for 35 years. And, um, yeah, that's good enough. That's good. You know, yeah. <laughs> if you think you're going to come here and be a, a star, or I know people who come here, I know one person from Iowa who came here, a young guy, he was 20, mm -hmm. he landed um, a series with John Ritter, John Ritter's show, and uh, landed a series like the month he moved here, and um, that was so unusual, and then of and then, of course, John Lewis passed away. But yeah. uh, and then he found it very difficult to work after that oh. you know, because of other other circumstances. You, know, you don't just land a series. And, you know, some some actors do. You see them all the time on every series. You know, yeah. oh that actor. You know, <laughs> okay. You know. Yeah, that's sad. You you did one of the earliest ABC after school specials with Go Ask Alice. Oh, go ask Alice. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I was a star after that. Let me tell you. Um, <laughs> I, I was my 10-year reunion in Minneapolis, and I went back. <laughs> and I, because of that show, everybody was going, oh, you're a star. You did go ask Alice. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it was another psychedelic, you know, 60s show. But then, at, by that time, I was living off of Sunset Boulevard. I lived uh, on Larrabee, which was by the Whiskey A Go-Go. And I had an apartment up there, and that was crazy time. So, you know, that was the 60s, and, and uh, yeah. you couldn't even walk Sunset Boulevard because it was uh, so crowded with people and drugs and things. And, oh, yeah. All, um, all the actors. Yeah, such an era. All the actors and all the musicians knew each other, you know, they'd go to hang out at the Whiskey or the Troubadour somewhere and see all the folk music or the rock music. It was, a, it was an incredible time, from what I've been told. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, it was like, well, it was like Laurel Canyon, the mu musicians hung out together and they all knew each other. Um, I was a little more, um, didn't, I didn't quite hang out there, hang out with uh, my theater buddies uh, in acting class more than that. Because uh, I was still so young. And so, yeah, I think coming from Minneapolis, 
Mm-hmm. In those days, when I was, I just graduated high school, 18, that was more like 12 years old, because I grew up very, like, <laughs> very conservative, very, you know, small town, you know, it was like, ah, I'm in the big city now. Uh, <laughs> you got to play a Manson girl in Hilter Skelter. Yes, I did. Um, I went for the interview. This is the only time this has happened. I, I, I went, I heard they were casting, and I called my agent and said, they're casting, and I, I know I must be right for one of the mansion people, you know. I mean, look at all the young girls. I'm exactly that age, you know. So I got an interview, and I walked in. I think this is when I met Barbara Remsen and the, the director, and I sat down, and they started to talk to me. And I said, oh, I, I think I could play one of the Mansons. I wasn't even thinking of Squeaky. And um, they said, and so they were, the director and Barbara were, they said, yeah, she could, yeah, she could do that. Yeah, she could play that. And I said, well, can, can I read? You know, can I read? And they said, no, no, no. I said, well, I, oh, I can't read that part. No, no. Yeah, you'd be good. Mm-hmm. And so I talked to them for a while, and they said, thank you very much. And I walked out, and I started to cry. I said, I can't even believe that I can't even read for this. And they just talked to me, and I went home, and I got a call a half hour later saying I got the part. Mm -hmm. The director uh, and the casting director, they were just, they would do that. They would get a feel of people rather than having them read the script, or at least for me, that was my my take on it. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, my God, what if I couldn't act? What if they, you know, (laughs) but, and I looked. So much like Squeaky. Well, then at the time she tried to kill the president. Yeah, you do. Well, a, you do look like you could pass as, as her at that time. <laughs> I was, except I was blonde and she had reddish coloring. But I had a, had this little apartment. And I'd go home and she was on the news a lot. Mm-hmm. Now here I was. I was going to play her, and um, she was on the news because she had just tried to kill the president, and she'd be on looking at the camera and I'd be looking at her and going, oh my God, we could be sisters. This is scary. And in fact, because the Manson people were still very active at that time, there were death threats to all of us. And I know Barbara the reps had to move or change her number and wow. um, they, they told us not to be in um, any contact with any of them. Um, and then we, we actually filmed on the location of the ranch. We used the same police people that um, had arrested the original Manson people on our shoot. And, um, but they said they're, they're very active and they could be dangerous. No one, no one got hurt or anything, but there were death threats. Yeah, I mean, in those days, there was no VHS, there was no internet, there was nothing that you could go and, like, do your research and, and watch, you know. You had to, like, n- you had to like meet the person, and those people you did not want to meet. <laughs> no, they told, they warned us, because I think a couple of the actors uh, wanted to meet the Manson people that were still, in, that were in prison. And they said, under no circumstances, try to contact the people that are in prison. So, um... I was lucky that Squeaky was, um, and that, um, and they, I think they, they had to change my name to Sandy because they couldn't use the word Squeaky because she was going to go on trial. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is, is that where you met uh, Eileen Dietz? Yes, yes. That's where we met. And, uh, uh, Actually, I met a lot of people from that shoot that we're in contact with. And I think Eileen and we tried to do, she does signing, you know, because she did a lot of horror movies. Oh, yes. Oh, she d- just did another horror movie. That's how I know um, her, yeah. She does that. <laughs> yeah, because I had her on the show last year to uh, promote a movie she had coming out that she was going to do a panel for at Monster Palooza in Pasadena. Yeah. And um, yeah. I, I met her there in person and stuff, yeah. She's, um, yeah, we, we did. She called me. She said, do, do you want to come on the other actors? Do there was a, they they were doing in Hollywood um, drive by things. You know, they always and one was the Manson where everybody got 
you know, killed and everything. But she said, do you want to have people meet you? And I said, oh, okay. So I, I did. I went there, and um, it was a tour company or something. Mm. But she does a lot of these uh, signings. Uh, yeah. They're very popular. They're they're very you know um, actors. Um, oh yeah, conventions. I've gone to so many in the last four years. I'm a late bloomer in discovering yeah. it. After I after I recovered from my car accident, I d- decided oh. to start living, and um, I discovered the convention scene. I I knew about it, but I didn't know how popular it was until 2016, and then I was hooked on them. And so I went to so many of them all the way until quarantine. I got to go to one more just before quarantine hit. Yeah, um, a friend of mine, um, Lee, Lee Merriweather. Oh yeah. Out of them. Yeah, she was, you know, Wonder Woman. Um, Catwoman. (laughs) She would give give money, because we belong to the same theater company. Yeah. And she would do them and then donate her uh, money that she would make and and donate it to our theater company, which was such a lovely, she's like the best woman ever, um, to our theater company. She would go and she'd go, oh, have some more money for the theater company. (laughs) She's the best, best. Oh, yes. She's Catwoman, not Wonder Woman. <laughs> oh, that's right. Catwoman, Catwoman. One, one of three Catwomen, I believe. Uh, Eartha Kitt and Julie yeah. Newmar. That's right, yes. Yeah. I have another friend who was a Manson girl in the movie, too. Uh, Carolina White. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not friends with her, but yeah. I know who she is. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful lady. She's been on the show many yeah. times. Now, leading up to Rescue from Gilligan's Island, how did you meet your husband, Lloyd Schwartz? Well, a friend of mine uh, fixed us up. She said, I have someone I want you to meet. And um, it was so funny. She had just fixed me up with someone else. It didn't work out. He was a doctor. And I (laughs) said, oh, it's not working out, so don't fix me up anymore. (laughs) No, no, no. I really have someone I need to fix you up with. So I, I, I kid, I kid Lloyd about this because he showed, now I know he was a producer and he showed up at my apartment. I think he was driving like a silver Porsche at that time or something. And he got this kind of leathery jacket or something. I went, oh, this is going to really be a disaster. And um, we went to a movie and, and we had a great time and um, we hit it off. And um, the rest is history. Yeah. So, um, uh, so he was really a nice guy, but when when I first met him, I go, "Oh, this is not going to work," you know. Yeah. But he's really was really so sweet, so so wonderful. So that's how we got fixed up. But it became a a boost to your career, I see. Um, yes, he likes. We like to work together. So, um, and he he he. Uh, if there was something that I could do, and at that time when when. I played that part. Um, I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. He said, well, you'll play. <laughs> you'll, you'll play the part. <laughs> and I actually am both, both, I did both of them. And I, and they were, I guess they were eight years, seven years apart. Uh, I was pregnant for both. Yeah. Really pregnant for both. So, um, yeah. Just, yeah I mean, we, we like to work together. He said, I can trust you. And he writes stuff for me because he knows, he knows my, uh, uh, how to write for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, do, do people still recognize you as Mrs. Powell? Well, not, no, not when I go out or anything like that. But, uh, um, yeah, when people see it, people will call me up, you know, they'll, they'll see and go, wait a minute, was that you? Would you, was that you in that? <laughs> you know, was that you in that part? You know, I get that a lot from different things because uh, something to play that I did really older, mm-hmm. um, and and they'll go, "Did you do that? I just saw you on that that thing, that movie, that whatever it is." You know, I, I had a friend who I did a commercial in the uh, well, it was Arizona, but it was playing the Southwest, and she was there. She said, "I just saw you on this commercial in Arizona." <laughs> yeah. Which was very fortunate because I found out they weren't paying me, and I said, "Hey, wait a minute! They're, it's plain." She said, "Yes." So I called my agent, and sure enough, they weren't paying me for it because I couldn't see it. Yeah. And then I got paid <laughs> for it. It was great. In fact, they, well, fortunately for me, unfortunately, it's for Banner Health, and so they just re they had renewed it 
because it was for their hospital mm-hmm. in uh, Banner Health Hospital there. Uh, so, yeah. What What was uh, Sherwood like as a father-in-law? Oh, he was very lovely. I mean, he was um, very generous, very lovely. He's very funny. He was very funny. Yeah. Was real. <clears throat> Great. You know, it's funny that both he and Lloyd have a sense of humor where, like, they would say something and I would, like, whoop over someone's head because they would say something. And if you weren't in tune to the humor, yeah. you might not get it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, and I would, I would look at them and I said, they didn't get it. No, nope, no. Nope. But uh, he's very, very, very quick, very smart. Yeah, I remember. Very, se- very intelligent man. You know? I remember seeing his interview on the Archive of American Television, and he was um, talking about uh, how he got the inspiration for Gilligan's Island. You know, he wanted to do something that was a commentary on, you know, divided classes of people and having to, like, come together and work together as a team. You know, I think that's a, a wonderful premise. Uh, for a show, you know, and he he made such a contribution to television with stuff like that, you know, and about how the Brady Bunch, yeah. you know, portrayed um, what would be otherwise a not so perfect, you know, situation for a family, but yet they they are the perfect family. <laughs> yeah, no, he he really tried that. Well, you you know, his sister, he wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, when he wasn't, because in those times. He wasn't accepted into medical school because they uh, only a certain amount of Jewish people could be accepted into medical school. Uh, so he always wanted to heal. So instead of being a doctor, um, he healed in a different way. He healed by by his writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. But but he originally wanted to be a doctor, um, and um, so this was his way of uh, trying to heal the world through his writing and. That, that is just so beautiful. That you know Art Lafleur. Oh yes, Art. Yes. I, I I talked to him last year. Yeah, he told me that uh, he's been a friend of the family for a long time, and that uh, Rescue from Gilligan's Island that was his first job. Yes, Artie and I met in an acting class, and uh, he is the dearest. Oh my gosh, he's so dear. Um, yeah, I guess that was his job, but then and he's gone on to have a nice career. Oh, God, he, he's that guy, you see, in, in everything. <laughs> yeah, but he is, he is like, he's so, he's just so, just warm. You know, he's just like this warm person, you know, and, and uh, generous person. And he is. Really, really a great guy, yeah. Yeah, I remember I, I met him at Monster Palooza a few years ago, and he was walking around, like, just hoping that he's not going to get recognized, right? And some guy did recognize him, and he was very gracious, uh-huh. and then and then said, I gotta go, I gotta go, because this is like, you know, early in the morning when everyone's outside waiting to go in, you know? He's he's yeah. like, he's like, hi, good to see you, I, I gotta go, I gotta go, you know? <laughs> he was very gracious. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's, uh, yeah, he's a humble, humble person, yeah. Very humble. But if you needed anything or, you know, he's, uh, yeah, just a great guy. Um, mm-hmm. As I told you yeah. in uh, Messenger, you know, I've, I've, t- I've talked to a few people from A Very Brady Christmas, Karen Richmond, Jennifer Runyon, and uh, Tanya Lee Williams, who played uh, Cindy's friend in that and stuff. And they just, they all enjoyed working on it. And, you know, Karen, you know, we, we went very in-depth about um, uh, the, the, the Brady's uh, show in, in 1990 and just how dark and soap, opera, soap opera-ish that show was. <laughs> Yeah, it took a turn. Yeah, it did take a turn. Yeah, I mean, like, but who wouldn't want to work on the Brady Show? You know, it's it's um, it's so beloved by everybody. You know, and so, yeah. and people are like, well, almost whatever else you do in your career, if you worked on a Brady Show or something with the Bradys or Gilligans, it's like that. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. oh, you did that. You know, oh, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah. High point for a lot of people. Do, do you know why uh, they wanted to go into that direction of, of, of being very dark like that? I, you know what? I, I'm not sure. 
to be honest, why they why they did that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think maybe they just wanted to change it up and just make it more. Um, yeah, they, I think I think things were tending at that time to go darker. You know, it was like a trend. Mm-hmm. Take stuff. You know, I mean, a lot of a lot of movies and stuff too. That they'll, t- well, they'll take the they start out one way and oh, well, let's push the button and make them darker. You know, and I'll go really. Oh, okay. And some people like that, and some you know, some people don't. But I I don't know why I had I had nothing really to do with that. So. Yeah, like what was your reaction? You were like, oh, okay. <laughs> Was it? Yeah, that's about all. Like you know, my input on on that is very little on um, what I could say. You know, and then also I, I didn't know if I if I would say um, if I say do something would be right or wrong anyway, because I wasn't the creative force in in the day of that. I was just uh, the only actor. Who, you know, <laughs> so I I didn't I I have very little input in, in that. The the Chris- none actually. Yeah, the Christmas movie though hints a little bit that that things were going to be dark in the um in the in the new series. I, my favorite scene is when Jan and Philip are arguing, and then Carol comes in to say it's time for breakfast, and then they like explain what their what their relationship in the last few months has been to her, and then next thing you know, it leads to a, re- a resolution, and then when Carol leaves, Jen and Philip have uh, what what is hinted to be a quickie. <laughs> that's like yeah. the early the, the that's like the early pres- precipice for uh, what what the show became in 1990. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. It took. Yeah. Well, I I think they want to just you know every you have something that works for a while. And then you say, okay, well, that's worked. So let's shake things up a bit. And let's see how that works. Yeah. No. So almost anything that has gone on for a while, and no matter how successful it is, they say, oh, let's shake it up a bit. Let's, let's shake things up and see how that plays. Yeah, I was talking to the uh, comedy writer Bruce Valanche last week. You know, he wrote for the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. And oh. he told me, he said... That show was wrong for the Brady Bunch. It should have been the Partridge family. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but they never, uh, Sherwood or, or Lloyd never had anything really to do with that. They, I don't think they thought it was going to work. Yeah. They had nothing to do with that. You know, they said, oh, this isn't going to be good. Yeah, it's one of those, um, you know, one of those those strange business decisions that you know has gone on, gone into the pop culture lexicon. I mean, they made fun of it on The Simpsons years ago. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, where well, least... I think I think everybody had fun working on it, um, but but then afterwards you look and I go, oh, did I do that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> fun at the time, but oops. <laughs> oops. <laughs> <laughs> How was working on airplane? Oh, that that was uh, you know who knew that that was going to become what it became? You know, um, uh, it just it just has a life of its own, which was which is great. You know, like I mean, I say no matter what I've done in my career, I've been in one, like two of the most famous things. That, well, almost three. I mean, the, the Brady. I mean the the Brady thing, and then um, Airplane and Helter Skelter, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it was just a little bit, but who knew? And, it's, and in fact, I've gotten hired on that, what I had, like two lines, you know, did, did you like a flower from the Church of Religious Science, I think was my line or something. Right. And I have it on my acting reel, you know, and, some, and it, my son said, who is a writer, producer, he said, um, no, have that on your reel. And I have gotten hired on that from that little thing because people go, "Oh, you were an airplane." Oh, yeah, well, we're going to hire you. <laughs> That's good. Okay. <laughs> All right. I said, but I, I said, but look at the way I look. I mean, like this is like fifty years ago, or no, forty. I don't know. But and I became like, um, what is you know, uh, kind of in to my kids' uh, friends, uh, you know, too. Because it was like, oh, your mom's an actress. Oh, she was an airplane. Wow, that changes everything. Yeah, <laughs> I know you got to have it on your reel because it's just it's it's too good not to be on there, you know. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, people and people laugh, and you know, I did a cartoon 
thing. And the director said, well, you know, one of the reasons we hired you is because we saw you were real and it was, uh, uh, had airplane on it. We knew you could do this then. Mm -hmm. So I went, oh, okay. I've talked to oh. Lee Bryant and Joyce Boulafont, and they're both very proud of their roles in it, too. Oh, yeah. Well, it holds up. It, it, uh, it, it's just, um, um, you can just watch that thing and watch that thing and still laugh out loud. Yeah, even with the and humor. They, they almost couldn't, you know, I mean, uh, Lloyd had told them, uh, um, they, you know, they, they submitted it a lot of times. Because mm -hmm. at that time, that had a certain sense of humor that someone had to get, you know, and so they got turned down. The script got turned down a lot because people didn't get it. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the the rest was history. Yeah. You know? Well, I heard that the uh, Universal, who made Airport, turned it down. Oh, I I don't know. A hundred and some people or more turned it down. They just you know, and there were these two guys because um, I knew their. Um, their cousin mm -hmm. um, and um, there's like two guys from Wisconsin who came out here and um, decided to write a movie <laughs> which was their point <laughs> um, uh, they had a show out here called the Kentucky Fried Theater yes <laughs> and my friend was in it their cousin was in it and uh, she called me one night she said I'm very sick I can't go on would you, and I, of course, I didn't have rehearsed or anything. And so, so, so I had to go on without rehearsal or anything in Kentucky Fried Theater and just wing it with them. And it, was, it was a very fun show, very raunchy, very fun show. I love, I love the movie. Um, I'm from San Francisco, and every year there's a festival, a comedy festival called uh, Sketch Fest. And um, just before I left, and they did a, a screening of Kentucky Fried Movie with the Zucker Brothers and John Landis, and I missed it. I didn't know about it until many months later because uh, I had a lot going on at the time, and I was just so devastated yeah. I missed that screening. That would have been a lot of fun to see on the big screen. How did you... How how did you get into doing a podcast? How did you get into doing that? That's what you're doing. Well, like I said before, um, I had my accident um, in January of 2015, and uh -huh. I had been a stand-up comedian, uh, doing a little bit of, of theater acting and stuff, and screenwriting before that, and um, wasn't I, I didn't know the business side, and I didn't know how to pursue it, and I, I had wanted to move to Los Angeles since I was a kid, and it just never worked out and stuff. Lots of family issues always went on and I was always the one that had to be there to help and stuff still am and I decided I was going to start this podcast I wanted to do it in 2016 but I didn't have any um I didn't have a good living environment to do it in so I had to wait and then um, I moved up here with my mother she needed me um and so I've been doing it ever since and I've gotten to 1081 interviews and more on the way <laughs> That's great. In just three three and a half years, in such a short time, yeah. too. Wow, that's that's great. But you're, are you feel you're okay? I mean, your accident, or I don't know what. I got. Uh, well, I, let's see. I broke my leg in seven places. I had a oh heart. Oh my gosh. I had a heart attack. Broke some teeth. Oh my broke, Fractured my hand. Lots of stuff happened. Um, oh. Yeah, you know, I got arthritis bad in my leg, and um, I've put on a lot of weight from not being active up here. But I'm in the stages of working on getting it off. I mean, I got I lost thirty pounds this year, so there's more yeah. that I have to yeah. do. But otherwise, I'm okay. Wow. Well, kudos for you for for getting this together and doing that, and you know. Oh. It's a great thing to get to meet and talk to. Well, I, I'm not, I not say that because of me, but very interesting people. <laughs> oh, you know, you've, <laughs> you've been very interesting because, you know, I love talking to journeymen. Uh, they're actually more fun to talk to than stars. I've, I've interviewed big stars like Eric Roberts and, and Ed Asner. They're, they were great, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but they just didn't open up to me like uh, the journeymen do. You know, I just love yeah. talking to them. And they, well, they, it's interesting you use that word journeyman. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I, I, call my, I call myself and most of my friends. I said, you know, like, 
we're, we're, we're journeyman actors. That's, that's exactly the word that I use. It's interesting you use that word. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm so immersed in acting and pop culture and, and entertainment that, you know, I use all the terms that you're supposed to use. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I think that you, you have to, you know, especially if you want to be in the business. Yeah. Well, I'm fortunate, too, because I'm at a certain age and I thought, oh, my God, there's not going to be any work. But actually, for older actors, I mean, I've been, even during the pandemic, I've had Zoom commercial auditions, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Doing an audition in your house, in your kitchen, <laughs> trying to set up, you know, all these technical things. Really, an I, interesting project. I, Luckily, my son, my son moved back home, mm -hmm. his wife and his dog, and I have to call out to them all the time, help, help, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I'm seeing all that Zoom crap every day, people doing that. It's just like I'm not into that because just everyone looks everyone looks weird on Zoom. Everyone's flesh tone is off. Everyone's got a delayed yeah. response to everything. You would think yeah. in, in today's world of technology, they would come up with something that had better quality, you know? Oh, it's a, cha it's a challenge for me. Let me tell you, it's such a challenge, all this new... new uh... Zooms and tapes and um, lighting and sound and I'm 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 almost I'm I'm totally lost in it. When my son moves out, I'm I don't know what I'm gonna do. And, and Lloyd is he he's not much better than me. We both are at an age that we just didn't grow up around this. Yeah. We didn't have cell phones, you know. <laughs> we were. I had a pager when I was acting. When I was acting, when I was young, I remember had a pager. And then you, you know, you got to be paged if you had an interview or something. That was how we did it. Oh, yeah. And I had, when I lived at the Hollywood Studio Club, there were actually ladies um, downstairs in the reception. And you had your little box, and they would answer the phone to you if your agent called. It was very much like the stage door, the like 1940s movie stage door. Right. Uh, and... Um, no men were allowed upstairs. You know. And then um, these, these ladies would sit in reception and you'd get a little note in your box if you got a call. It's so funny <laughs> when I think about that. It is pretty funny, yeah. Oh, I forgot to mention, you had a um, role in Ken Russell's movie, Whore. Yes, Whore, yes. <laughs> I, think I, I did all those things. I was always, like, eat yeah. up and... You know, yeah, that, I, you know, that was, that was my, um, yeah. Yeah, I saw that movie once about 15 years ago. I liked Teresa Russell's performance in it. I thought she was very talented. Yeah, I have not seen that. And I don't, I don't know. I really, about 40 years, I haven't seen that movie. But I don't hardly remember it. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was one of those like direct-to-video type of movies. Yeah, yeah. So when you're, um, so so when you're um, not when when quarantine's not going on, you're, you're I mean, you are still acting, right? I am still acting. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, I did a reoccurring thing on um, Safe for No Safe for Today. Ah, it's a soap opera. Um, days of No Days of My Life. One of those. Um, yeah. well, I played a nun with Alzheimer's. And it was a running, um, uh, running part. And that was a couple of years ago. And then I really produced. Um, I have a theater company, that, uh, so I've been producing plays for kids for 35 years. And um, uh, going in and doing teaching workshops in schools, we did that. Mm -hmm. We go in and work with with kids uh, in schools, and. Um, just before the quarantine, we were supposed to go to Ventura and bring one of our shows to 1,200 kids up in Ventura County. They're, they they wanted us to come and do, we've done it for 1,200 kids. So, um, yeah, that's been going on, uh, yeah, for 35 years. We've, um, we've got, we've got now videos out on, on, a, a, on YouTube. Yeah. And, um. So that kept me busy, and it was really nice. 
it's been so good because I could be in a show. I'm actually getting actors' equity pension, which is very rare, you know, yeah. but because I put myself in shows, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it was glorious to be able to do that, and hopefully, we'll be able to go back, you know, in a year or so, We're trying to keep our theater afloat. Hopefully, yeah. we can. Yeah, I worry. I worry about that whole live performance thing after the, after all of this because it's just it's been a big part of my life seeing theater and going to the movies and stuff. But dri- drive-ins yeah. have, drive-ins have opened back up again. Yes, yes, yeah. That's that's at least you know people are trying to do as much as they can do. You know, so drive-ins are great. You know, I've taken my grandsons through you know these these holiday drive-in drive-through things. They can't even go to school. They're not even in school. They're doing the homeschooling. But, um, yeah, uh, my theater company has performed for thousands and thousands. We did every Saturday. We did during the week for school. So I had we had field trips for, for uh, classes to come, and there were fairy tales. So in the elementary schools, they would study fairy tales and do a whole section about it, see our play. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and it was great. And then when I would go into schools and teach, it was about not, not being actors. It was really about working together and not bullying and uh, just getting kids outside of themselves because I know how hard it was for me when I was growing up. I was very shy. So we would go in there and we would start the class and kids who wouldn't talk or wouldn't do anything, by the end of it, they were singing and dancing and it helped their work, helped their school. Teachers would tell us that they became different, uh, different kids because of us going and working with them. Do, do, you, do you ever get disabled students? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We we had uh, uh, special ed students. Uh, we had a lot of autism uh, kids with autism. And mm-hmm. and and you've heard this, but like music and singing, you know, all that. Um, we, we had we had a couple of kids actually who came to our theater who never spoke. They were in elementary school and they didn't speak. And I remember we were doing Little Red Riding Hood. And the wolf was uh, interacting with Red Riding Hood, and one of the students ran on stage and said, "Don't talk to the, don't do that, don't do that." I mean, he had never spoken before. <laughs> the teacher them and they were crying, you know, but he had such a visceral reaction to what we were doing. I mean, our shows were all really gentle and, and nonviolent, but he 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 felt the need to speak, and that happened more than once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have um, I have Osberger syndrome, and uh, I was in special ed in school. That's that's another reason, probably, why I wasn't accepted by the theater kids and stuff. Yeah. I was just yeah. I was I was always dressing up around the house and playing characters from my favorite movies and imitating my favorite yeah. stand-up comedians and stuff. That was just my outlet, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know, and, and things are changing. Though I think think I think people are more accepting of everybody now, you know, and a little more. Uh, yeah, yeah. I w- we we I think we helped a lot, a lot of kids in. And what we did in our presentations, I hope so. I hope so. I hope very, so. very, very proud. Uh, I said, was, I don't do anything ever now, ever again. I did that or doing that, and that's that's great. Yeah, it, it's definitely um, it's definitely improved. I mean, the elementary school I went to has a much better special ed program now than it did when I was there. Um, there's that, and then, um, I mean, it's just, it, I guess it also depends on what area you live to. Like, I, I lived in Arizona for a little while, back in uh-huh. 2007. I went to, I think it was I think it was Costco or Walmart or someplace to, to get a job. There was one disabled person there, this young girl. She had to have been at least 20, and she was getting screamed at by everybody, and I just felt so really? bad for her. Yeah. Wow. This was 13 years ago. I, I, I hope... Wow. It, I hope she's doing much better now and she's not working there now. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's terrible. Just terrible. Yeah, I know, because, I mean, living in Los Angeles, I mean, I tell my kids, this too, we're, we're kind of in a bubble in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, that um, people are, I know, they're more accepting of people and we have such a diverse 
group of people in, in every way here. And then you go in different parts of the country and, you know, I mean, I, I'm Jewish. But I grew up in certain, back then in Minnesota that was very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. oh, really? I said, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't feel that here, but it, it, it's, yeah, I had, I had some bad uh, experiences that way. My wow. parents couldn't buy a house in certain parts. Yeah. In Minneapolis. My uh, my parents grew up in the Bay Area and it was very segregated. Um the neighborhood that they grew up in, I grew up in as well. Um when I was growing up there, of course, it was mixed. Everyone was accepted, but when they grew up there, it was all white. All the um blacks and the uh, Chinese and the um, Latinos, they all had to live on this other part of town, which ironically, they still do live on that part of town, but the neighborhood that we grew up in is is now everybody mixed. Yeah. 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 Which is great. I mean, I mm -hmm. unfortunately, the divide now is politically you know, but that's another subject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another subject. Yes. Hey, Barbara, so I tell jokes on the show. Yeah. And I got some funny Christmas jokes for you. Okay. What, what, why did Santa frown upon getting a sweater for Christmas? Why? He wanted a moaner or a screamer. Wait, say that again. The punchline? Yeah, no, say the whole thing again. Why did Santa why did Santa frown upon getting a sweater for Christmas? Okay, why? He wanted a moaner or a screamer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Right. Okay, give me another one. Okay. Why did okay, why did the snow why did why did Frosty the snowman have a smile on his face? He saw the snowblower across the street. <laughs> okay, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad those don't go over your head like uh, like like uh, your husband and your father-in-laws. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's funny, but it's funny, but just, just a great thing, uh, one of the things I would do when I would go into the older classes is I would give them jokes to, to say in front of the class. Right. It was always a great, the kids loved it. it was, that, that was their favorite thing. They didn't have to give up and do a joke. Mm -hmm. Where did you get the jokes from? Well, I looked them up. I, I, I went online. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, I, I would uh, uh, and I would have some, one of the, one of, either someone say the, the, the joke and then some of the punchline or what, but the kids loved it. Or, and then I would find that, of course, everybody almost had a joke. They go, no, wait, wait, I've got one, I've got one. And that would, I think that would be the best thing that the kids love to do when I would go up there. I, I've been a joke teller my whole life. It started with my father telling me jokes, and then my stepfather, um, he got me more immersed in it. Um, when the internet came, he told me about jokes.com, and I would just go there every day and just find stuff. And it's, it's become my modus operandi. Uh, everybody knows that when they're going to be around me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them dirty jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Well... I say that one thing in our, our family uh, it, is that we have to have a sense of humor. Our, our family, you know, it's, uh, and I, my grandkids are like the best. I mean, they're the funniest kids ever. And um, I said that's that's the thing of our family. Maybe that's third was sh well, was Sherwood, but our family always found the funny found the funny things of of life. The funny things of I life. No matter what, you have to try to find something funny humorous make you smile in order to to keep going i agree you always do well barbara i thank you so much for coming on today you are just so kind and wonderful well thank you uh i really 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 this has probably made my week maybe my month um no thank you so much for having me on and talking with you yes anytime if you think of anything else Call me up. Oh, absolutely, I will. And uh, you have a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and stay safe because the world needs people like you. Uh, thank you so much.
My pleasure. Thanks. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Barbara, Sh Barbara Mallory Schwartz. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, my God. What a kind lady, like I said. I'm so glad I talked to her. God, I get so lucky. Uh, dime a dozen. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. Dun, 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 dun.